You're a lawyer. You're a lawyer. You're a lawyer. Stop being bad at things. You're a bad lawyer. It's knuckle puck time! What the heck kind of a shot was that? You've never heard of a knuckle puck? Whoa! Crack! Crack! It's knuckle puck time! Welcome everyone to Knuckle Puck Time. My name is Andrew Apple. I remain David Hankler. And I'm Hark Winsky. Today, Mighty Ducks, Game Changers, Episode 3. An episode that made me much happier than last week. God, let's hope so. <laughs> yeah, uh, apologies for being Angry Tofu last week. It didn't matter how organic it was, Mark. It was Angry Tofu. <laughs> so... We're going to get into the uh, Mighty Ducks Game Changers episode in just a bit, but I want to try something new again this week. Um, this may be a recurring segment, uh, but if not, it's it's I, I think it's worthy of us talking about because last week we did sort of touch on how Disney does have an exceptional ability to tug at our nostalgic heartstrings. Has an ability or they are like the masters of yeah. all nostalgia and has it down to a complete science down to the nuanced tactics that every Disney cast member is taught. Just saying from experience of being a Disney cast member, I know some things that will haunt your nightmares. All right. I don't want to get us demonetized <laughs> on YouTube. I want to know. <laughs> Wait, what things that'll haunt my nightmares? We don't need to tell me now, but I'm going to want to hear this later. Yeah, Stay I just think tuned. of Disney as owning childhood. Stay tuned for more. They so understand the language visually and, and orally of tapping into what it means to be a kid and then tapping into what it means to stop being a kid and then tapping into being an adult who looks back on childhood. Like They, they know that language better than any company or, or creator in history. Which is why I would like to start with our segment, Dear Disney, Please Take My Money Now. So this is a report that comes from www.info.com. Earlier today, when we're recording, there was a virtual event that Disney held called A Special Look Inside Disney Parks. And it was hosted by Josh DeMauro, who is the chairman of Disney Parks Experience and Products. Apparently... At the end of his presentation, he said the words, you never know what we're going to come up with next. And according to reports, because they did not allow any screenshots of this, he then pulled out a small box, which revealed a lightsaber, turned it on, and the light blade appeared out of thin air. The only two words he said after that was, it's real. Hmm. Later on, Walt Disney Imagineer Scott Trowbridge responded on Twitter by saying the following words, yes, it was and is really real, and not yet. David, what do you think about the prospect of Disney having gone so far that they have now literally created lightsabers? What are your thoughts? It really depends on what the lightsaber actually is in this context. If it is contained laser light, that they figured out some way to actually stop a laser from going beyond a certain point, and it's just a visual. One, I don't know how Disney broke physics, but I would like to know, because I'm sure that there are an enormous number of tech companies that are trying to develop technology similar to this uh, for communications in space, for example, that would really love to know how to limit something to an exact distance that's a light. Um, if they have figured out a way to actually create a laser sword, a, a true weapon, freaking cool. <laughs> and also, there are going to be so many people who accidentally cut their own limbs off. Like, like, how do you not play with it immediately? How do you not? I mean, this is this is the, the weapon that we all as children dreamed of having, and you know, you have to the roll from wrapping paper around the holidays and you'd spin it around like a bow or you'd make the sounds and you'd lightsaber duel with it. And if you actually gave me the chance to hold a, a real weapon that could cut through a wall, I would not get my security deposit. I'm not gonna ever give you a lightsaber, David. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't ask for your permission. <laughs> oh, I will. I, I'm a grown man. I can make bad choices on my own. Hey, honey. 
Toss me, toss me the beer, let me slice it in half. <laughs> and then pass me another one to drink. <laughs> Well, slicing. You think it would vaporize the liquid as you did it? It's a laser. Could you cut a beer in half with a lightsaber and not get wet? Yes. Or would it just boil it instantly? Stay tuned <laughs> while we try it at the end of this episode. Stay tuned while David pre-calls his old EMT friends to stand by in case he covers himself in burns. Well, that's, that's the main thing we don't know right now. Like you said, we don't know if this is just a toy that lights up. Uh, but if it is a weapon and we are going by Star Wars law, then you would not get wet. Much like when Luke's hand was cut off, it did not bleed. Fair. That's an instant cauterization, though. But blood comes in pumps. Beer is a compressed liquid in a can. If you cut a hand off, it will not immediately spray blood, um, blood everywhere like a fire hose. This is a horrific thing to talk about, but like I was an EMT for eight years... I don't know if you just heard that, but yes, I was an EMT for eight years, and bodies don't work like they do in the Adams Family values. It's, it's not vaudeville-style fire hoses. By comparison, if you cut a can in half, it will explode, especially because it's carbonated. If your blood is ever carbonated, that's your number one problem. But wouldn't the heat from the lightsaber immediately evaporate all of the water just because it would immediately get to that level of boiling it would immediately evaporate any liquid with which it came in contact so it would cut through you know without getting wet but that doesn't mean that it would evaporate all the liquid in the can if it did that the can would explode with insane force and you would have metal shrapnel everywhere more likely it would va like just vaporize the the beer the liquid whatever that it came in contact with and superheat the rest of it, meaning you now have boiling beer flying at you. This sounds amazing. I want one. Yes. <laughs> Disney, take my money. The YouTube videos are going to be oh gosh, really funny and also potentially real bad. Here's the thing. I I gotta be skeptical. I, I mean, Disney's Disney. They'll do anything to talk about their business in the media, and it's working right now. Guess they had a tiny box that happened to have something that resembled a lightsaber, although no one actually saw it, I guess, except people who were there. That is what the story says. The people who were there saw him wield the lightsaber and turned it on and immediately say that it was not CGI, it was real. And this was later confirmed by Walt Disney Imagineers. If it's real, I can't wait to see the first video of somebody carving a dick in the ground. <laughs> it's gonna happen. Someone's just gonna walk out in the middle of a road and just pothole a dick into the ground. Can you can you lightsaber a f fart is the next That'll happen. Question. We'll yeah. see. Yep. Like I I I feel it it'll Would it go make a sound? Beer, yeah. Beer mm -hmm. can. Yep. Dick in the ground. Yep, ground dick, yep. Fart. Like, that's the progression. I Freud think so. would agree. I think so. Andrew, <laughs> your thoughts. <laughs> I just. You made me hold me laugh. The... <laughs> I, I'm not sure I have anything to add after that. No, honestly. try it. Try us. Try us. I want to see someone try and make a window with it and then not realize that insulation, if it's older, is flammable. So just be like, oh, oh no, oh no, and now your house is on fire. As you, you <laughs> it's, it's something that David, you and I have talked about quite a bit. If our future is Star Wars, I am very concerned. Oh yeah, no, Star Wars is incredibly entertaining to watch, but it is a dystopia. Yes. Uh, so if all of a sudden. You have a bunch of people with no code running around with what is arguably the most dangerous weapon in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, I, I do have some concerns. I'm still gonna give that to a gun. Just gonna put that out there. Can't it block, can't it block a gun though? Yeah, exactly. but you have to be fast enough. I mean, come on, like Bruce Lee legendarily could allegedly catch a bullet 
which is, I don't think that's possible. He was amazing. He was one of the fastest humans to ever live in terms of his reflexes. Catching a bullet is basically impossible in terms of just physics. Hitting a baseball that's going 100 miles an hour is almost impossible. Catching a bullet? Nah. To block a lightsaber, and it would basically not block it, it would just melt it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you would have to turn the lightsaber to perfectly intercept that bullet. And in that situation, I don't know if that would actually stop it, it or just turn it into melting lead that's just flying into your chest, in, no longer in a bullet form, <laughs> just melted, continuous burning metal. <laughs> Or, I, or, or, or slice it right in half and both pieces of said bullet go on opposite s- s- sides mm. of you. That's how I see it playing out. Also, we're getting into semantics right now because I personally do not consider guns to be hand-to-hand combat. Indiana Jones would disagree. There is a reason why you always bring a gun to a knife fight. You're a bad sport. Don't do that. <laughs> it's a knife fight. If you establish that it's a knife fight, you don't bring a gun. What kind of jerk are you? Do you want to win? I would bring a sword. There's no definition to what a knife is. I can play with not, the semantics. Is there not? No, I don't believe that there is any national standard metric of this is the maximum length of a knife before it becomes a machete, before it becomes a sword. I don't believe that's a thing. A Google, a Google, what is... A knife. Guys, <laughs> Crocodile Dundee <laughs> established this years ago. Right, he established that a machete was a knife. Or was it just a giant hunting knife? Ha <laughs> oh, no, here, here we go. Here's okay. what, here's what, um, Swords of Northshire.com says. An authority. It says, it says <laughs> knives are multi-purpose. Mm-hmm. And swords are usually made with one purpose in mind. So if I butter my toast with a sword, it becomes a knife. A multipurpose, yes. Yeah, okay. So it is not a length definition. It is an intention definition. So I can bring a, a knife of any length to a knife fight. Knives are generally six inches or less. Generally. Well, swords are generally a foot or longer. Okay, how long is a machete? Andrew, no, Andrew, no. We're not commenting on dick sizes here. I actually wasn't gonna comment on dick size. I I was gonna comment that by that definition, uh, a foot or longer and one specific purpose, that means that (laughs) hockey sticks are swords. No, they're not, because they're not made of metal. Mark, does it say they need to be made of metal? No. I mean, I guess there are ceramic knives. So, okay. But they do tend to be sharpened. Otherwise, every stick is a knife. Are trees just bunches of knives? What kind of chaos are you embracing here? According to swords of northshire.com, which is now our new authority. It is. Uh, knives are mostly tactical in nature. Where swords are made for combat. That does not help us with our made of metal and must they be sharpened argument at all. I mean, Andrew, under your definition, every old person with a cane is armed with a sword. Which is my, frankly, my dream. I'd love that idea. It says blade. Blade, blade is used a lot. Okay. So so blade could also be an ice skate. (laughs) By definition, the Mighty Ducks are ninjas. They are all armed at all times. Happy Gilmore would agree. So with that in mind, what do you think, audience? Let us know in the comments below. Are you excited to get a lightsaber? Do you think that it's going to lead to any level of chaos? And are hockey sticks swords? And can you slice a fart with a lightsaber? I assume it wouldn't be a slice. It would be an instant vaporization, much like the beer comment, that the gas would come out and then you would just see... A, an instant color burst, probably some slightly off color from the lightsaber, and I bet there would be a sound. It would be like two farts. You'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> speaking of multisyllabic farts, 
<laughs> Gordon Bombay, the way that he explains his history in this episode, which is extremely welcome, at least in my sense, uh, doesn't actually make any sense. And I'm going to rant about that a lot in this episode, though I enjoyed it. Andrew? We are going to get to that in, in the penalty box, but let's do a quick recap. Well, kids, the Don't Bothers are on thin ice going into their second game, playing none other than the Mighty Ducks. Realizing to that their best path is to money puck the game, as Nick so rightfully puts it, the team begins a charm offensive to lure Sophie away from the Ducks. No small task. Meanwhile, Alex is trying to become a real coach with a real notebook full of plays, but unfortunately there isn't enough coffee in the world for her to learn the game of hockey in a timely manner. But then, my friends, it happened. Whether it was the go get him attitude of the kids or just his inability to stomach watching them suck anymore, Gordon Bombay helps the Don't Bothers by sneaking a play into Alex's coaching notebook. Fun fact, also the home of her grocery list. Also, there's a B story where we learn that Winnie the concession stand girl is incredibly sex positive when it comes to dating the various vendors that supply food to the Ice Palace. Nick develops a big old crush on her that in great sitcom fashion gets resolved by the end of the episode. And again, the game against the Ducks goes exactly like you would expect. The Ducks run up the score 17 to nothing, but then Alex discovers Gordon's play in her notebook, and as the clock runs out, Evan uses said play to score a breakaway goal to avoid a shutout. The Ducks do not take this win well. Sophie, now recognizing that the Ducks are the bad guys, agrees to join the Don't Bothers. Everyone rejoices until they realize that she's 12 and can't switch teams without her parents' permission. And yes, we finally find out why Gordon Bombay hates hockey. His time at St. Paul State ended abruptly when he gave money to one of his players who didn't have enough to get some food or tape for his stick. But maybe, just maybe, the Don't Bothers might be hockey's ticket back into his heart. So, we like to start on a positive note on this podcast. So, we're going to jump right into our segment, The Best of Bombay. So, Mark, tell us what you loved about Gordon Bombay this week. I do have to say that I was excited that Gordon Bombay finally came out of his shell a little bit to the coach of yore. He he opened up as a human for the first time in the show when when Nick was b- back in the dumpster throwing away these beautiful flowers that w- were brought by Winnie's ex Partner, boyfriend, person. Coco Chad. Coco, Coco Chad. Chad. And he was jealous. He th- threw away the flowers. And Coach Bombay was like, hey, kid, don't do that. Here's why. And he gave a little pep talk. And I'm like, oh. Oh. He still got it. He still got his pep talks in him somewhere on a deep level. Um. And that was nice to see. David, what are your thoughts? What, what was your best of Bombay this week? My favorite thing with Bombay this week was that he openly admitted that it's selling cocoa for $2 that costs him two cents to make that keeps the lights on. I really appreciated that just brass tax acceptance of the massive markup that is done at every snack bar everywhere in this country. Uh, when I was in high school, the snack bar by where our teams used to play sports was just openly known as Rob's Ripoff. <laughs> like, I think it had a real name at one point, but he had a sign-up that said Rob's Ripoff because that had been the name for so long. And it was like, oh yeah, buy a Snickers. It's two fifty, And you're like, don't these cost you like 18 cents at Costco? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> you're not at Costco right now, are you? Exactly. You're are at you a hungry? high school basketball game and you're hungry. Give me money, sucker. So yeah, I really appreciated just how open and direct he was in front of his customers, his probably most consistently paying customers. Speaking of customers, who who else comes to the Ice Palace, I'm wondering, because we don't see anybody else. 
I mean, we know that there are birthdays because a third of his diet is cake, mm -hmm. both metaphorically and not. Uh, but yeah, beyond that, um, I also was highly amused by the moment that he took the Zamboni out on the ice during their practice, considering they pay for the rink during practice. That is, in fact, the only time of the entire day that we've seen where the rink legally cannot be cleaned. They own the ice at that time. So that was preposterous and deeply arrogant, and I like that. Well, I think it actually plays really nicely into the Bombay that we are seeing slowly come out of his cocoon because there is a through line from... These are my only paying customers. I cannot do anything to get rid of them no matter how hard I try. Let's see how hard I can push this. Oh, wait, I can push this as hard as I want and they're still going to be uplifted and generally happy people. Maybe I can take something away from this beyond just being a sad, angry soul. I like that. I like that way of looking at it. I agree. Because you rightfully pointed out, David, uh, that one thing that Bombay has been very good at, and Mark, you, you, you alluded to this as well. One thing that Bombay has been very good at is somehow melding this world of being broken down and weary by all he's gone through while still finding a way to make a lesson out of it that ends up being helpful and saving the day. It's a really fascinating thing, and I'm really impressed by these new writers that Stephen Brill brought on to run the show, or realistically that Disney brought on to run the show, because of the three episodes that have been written so far, the only credited writers are Stephen Brill on the first episode, and after that, it's our showrunners, Josh Goldsmith and Kathy Yuspa. And I really like the way that they have started to build this world and say, okay, this is our baseline, but let's use all the toys in our toy box to still make this a happy thing. It still feels, it still feels to me, like some of these things are pandering just for the sake of pandering. Yeah, they know what they're doing. They want us to feel how we feel. And it worked because we were waiting for Gordon Bombay to give some sort of pep talk because that's what he does. That's who he is at his core, right? Um, so when it happened, it was like an injection of excitement and then like shoulders dropped in and was like oh now what like it gave us the taste and now i i'm hungry for, for more bombay like i i i i want more of that like yum, 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 yum. yeah and to me this sort of felt like this was the first television episode that we actually had because we had a fully self-contained story that wasn't reliant on the lore of the previous three movies. It had a solid A story that for the most part wrapped itself up, but also set things up for the next episode and a really enjoyable B story with the whole Winnie Coco Chad, Nick has a big old crush on her, and eventually she ends up with giant Nick, a.k.a. Mustard Tim. Who really did look shockingly like Nick. But what do you think? What was your favorite Bombay moment? Let us know in the comments below. If you're watching on YouTube, the comment box is right there. If you're a podcast listener, feel free to leave it in the review section of this podcast on your preferred platform, or you can go to knucklepucktime.com and leave your comments on the show page. I'm not a beggar, but it's very helpful that people do and support the artist, right?
Yeah, costs you nothing. It and it makes a huge difference to us. And if you say something nice, we will gladly read it on the air and send you a t-shirt once we get t-shirts. And if you say something really mean and it's really funny, we will also read it on air and send you a t-shirt once we have t-shirts. I do not guarantee it'll be the right size. And if you do happen to get a hold of a lightsaber, please take a video of you trying to cut a fart in half and send it to us and we will for sure post it on every social media out there. All right, guys. So I want to talk about the fact that this episode pointed out, on one hand, there were a lot of realities of growing up that they pointed out. There was a ton of striving for perfection that they will never reach. But there was also a ton of self-awareness in this episode. Our main storyline involves the Don't Bother's putting on this charm offensive to lure Sophie away from the ducks and make her the sharpshooter, the Adam Banks, as we have alluded to. Number nine. There it is. But there were a lot of moments that were surprisingly self-aware. Like at one point, Ev was it Evan or Sophie, but in the pizza scene, one of them says, um, I was looking into my college prospects and then I realized I'm 12. Yeah, that was Evan. Evan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Mark, what do you think about the fact that this show seems to really have a pulse on what kids are going through today and its level of self-awareness? I think th the pressure that is put on kids these days is exorbitant i think it is unbelievable how even just based on a show that we're talking about they're 12 they're 12 and already thinking i gotta be on this i can't get into harvard ever like that was her quote that she didn't like getting a b because she wouldn't be able to get into harvard and they're in seventh grade right now um it, it's just it feels tr tr truthful to real life it it, it 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 seems like what's really going on especially in athletics with scholarships with all these things what's interesting i'm just thinking of this if 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 she wants to go to Harvard, does she want to play hockey at Harvard? Does she want a scholarship? Does she need a scholarship? Like, that's... That's actually an excellent point. Harvard doesn't offer athletic scholarships. <laughs> yeah. Now, they absolutely do let people in who fully qualify and who also tend to be really good at sports. I had several friends who went to Harvard, Yale, Princeton... None of whom receive scholarships because the Ivy League schools do not give athletic scholarships. But all of them got into those schools with the explicit understanding that they would also be playing a sport while they are there. So, Is that true? I didn't yeah. even know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very close friend of mine. Uh, I had a like, very, very, very smart guy. Very driven. But uh, joined the crew team the end of his senior year of high school. And he's 6'4", and at the time weighed about 210, maybe. And he broke the school record for a 2K in the ERG the first time he ever got on, and which is very impressive because our like the school I went to competed nationally in crew every year and regularly was in the top three or four for various boats. And he just he crushed the record the first time and then beat it again the second time he ever tried. So Harvard and Yale were literally fighting for him. Now, they couldn't offer him scholarships, but they kept talking about all the additional things that they could just make happen for him. So it's it's a weird, shadowy game. So being great at hockey would definitely help her get into Harvard. It would not help her pay for Harvard. And David, I think you rightfully pointed out, or we, we, you and I have talked about this in the past, uh, that college fundraising, getting donors and alumni to give the school money 
is heavily done upon the backs of its student athletes and the yes. level at which they perform. Absolutely. Oh my God! If 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 y'all want to go and watch an incredible documentary, watch Student Athlete. Hmm. It's HBO. Um, it's called Student Athlete. It's all about how these in big air quotes right now the student athlete is a multi million dollar if not billion dollar company an industry oh, yeah. and they're treating these kids these children like property mm -hmm. and um especially of of a poured demographic as well saying come to our school we'll give you a free education and also make millions of dollars off of your likeness and off of your yep. status and off of your playing ability That's why the supreme court is about to rip the ncaa apart i hope they do did you see any of the quotes from the first testimony when sonia no. sotomayor and brett kavanaugh are in full agreement Oh. You're going to really get just destroyed. Like, it's going to go so badly for the NCAA. When you can unite this Supreme Court in going, no, you're the bad guy. Like, it's going to be bad. It's going to, like, college sports are going to very radically change at some point in the next year. And uh, to tie this back into what we're talking about now in terms of the show, my fear is that will, in fact, make things worse in terms of the level of competition on some level, I absolutely believe that the athletes should be compensated. The idea that someone is making money off of their name, their likeness, is criminal to me. The not just a little money, not just a little money, but like oh, no. amounts of money. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, the NCAA yeah. is a multi-billion dollar per year non-profit. Yeah. Uh, but if they change it so that uh, it is a standard rate that every college athlete is paid per hour okay uh there will still be complaints and issues that there that is not a perfect answer but that at least would prevent my greatest fear which is that they basically like they will just become young professionals uh which like frankly they should be yeah they should be i don't care if you're mm -hmm. eight years old if you are good enough to play professionally in any sport frankly if you're good enough to work in any field whatsoever I don't care how old you are. If you can do it, go for it. And I hope that you have the support system around you to help you emotionally, mentally, and, and physically. Physically, safety, yeah, yeah. Safe, yeah, I mean, there's a real danger. You know, if you're 18 years old, uh, you know, if you can hit 50% of your three-pointers, you could go pro immediately. But if you're 18 years old, you might still be growing and might weigh a buck 75 at 6'10", at which point you're going to get hurt. Well, look at Sophia with knee problems or like with right. we see this yeah. in the episodes. She's yep. 12. She's 12 and and already dealing with knee problems? Are you kidding me? You you hear about it in travel baseball teams all the time. Kids oh, yeah. uh getting needing Tommy John surgery at 13, 14 years old. Kids destroying their shoulders for the future before they're 15 because they're trying trick you know trick pitches when their shoulders haven't finished developing yet. It's brutal. And I feel bad for these kids because they are in a constant state of competition from before they even understand what it is they're working towards. They have no concept of what the world is or what the advantages of a Harvard degree really might do for you. You might have some loose idea, but it's marketing. And yet you're going to dedicate so much of your life and so many hours of stressed obsession to achieving this goal that may be a complete waste of your time in some cases. That friend that I was mentioning earlier who com who was had Harvard and Yale battling over him is very happily a tutor in Michigan now. I mean, I don't think he particularly enjoyed his time at the school he attended. I don't think he appreciated the way that the school treated him considering uh, after his freshman year there, he severely herniated two discs in his back which meant that he couldn't row crew anymore, and the school kind of just tossed him aside. He was already in, but they stopped caring about him, especially when they don't owe you a scholarship. They just kind of stopped caring, and he's been in pain since. So 
you are a commodity in these realities. And that's brutal and unfair, especially to children. You know, that's actually the thing that makes next week's episode so interesting and makes me really look forward to our conversation about that because we know that next week for the first time, we're going to see the parents on the ice. The A story is going to involve um, one of the Ducks mothers, the one who is Alex's boss that I can't remember her name right now. Right. Uh, and Alex going head to head in a, uh, a shootout. That is a fascinating concept to deal with because everything that you were saying was 100% true. But there is a massive difference between being treated as a commodity in a sport like basketball, where if you can get $20 together to buy a ball, you can become successful in that sport. And in hockey, where there is a very large financial barrier to entry, as we have seen so far. And as we have talked about, rich people look at the world very differently than those who see athletics as their only way out. Because the reality situation is one of the reasons that I think we're all okay is because we know Sophie's going to be fine. Like, if she gets injured and she can't play hockey anymore, she would probably be just like your friend, a lot happier. You know, she could focus on her grade. She could find something else she wants to do. But we find out in this episode that, you know, in addition to being a hockey star, she's also involved in the science fair where she needs to get an entire thing ready for the competition. They don't tell us what it is, but it's a different world when you're dealing with people who have money versus people who see athletics as their only way out of poverty. It's interesting because so much of the framework of the class battle in the Three Mighty Ducks movies is inherently the the haves and the have-nots, and those who are haves, they always have them anchored in as, of course you have to win. Winning is a as a must. You, you know, you are the best. The fact that being the best is directly tied to them having money and then therefore resources and whatnot uh, is I always found deeply uncomfortable. But that is part of the anchored mentality through those movies that the haves are obsessed with winning, and the people most obsessed with winning in this episode are the parents. That's something that I really look forward to them exploring more in the series. The idea that, I mean, Sophie, clearly her family has money. But her obsession with being the best at absolutely everything. I mean, a full Coach Riley, it's not worth winning if you can't win big kind of mentality. And that is deeply instilled in her by her parents. So it's going to be really interesting to see the pushback against her own parents in the next episode, as we we touched on in the recap, that she has to ask her parents if it's okay to transfer from a legendary hockey team where she is the star to a team so bad they don't even have a mascot. Mark, any final thoughts? No. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, what did you think of the self-awareness of the episode and what do you think of the kids going through something that mirrors what kids actually go through today? Let us know in the comments below or in the review or on knucklepucktime.com and we're excited to hear your thoughts. So next, we're going into my favorite segment, The Duck Hunt. That was pretty good. Thank you. If you if you just taught Bombay how to do that, then he wouldn't have needed to be late for that freaking game in D2. <laughs> right? He was searching all over L.A. All over um, L.A. Um, trying to it. find a freaking duck whistle. All he had to do was take his hand, put it over his mouth, and do a little... 
done. If only he had YouTube back then. He could have just looked it if up. Only, if only. If only. The uh, days when we had to find the friend's cool older brother to ask them how to do stuff. Right. But, yes, the duck hunt. Uh, I There was one Easter egg, you know, one, one duck in this episode that I found that I thought was both very charming and infuriating. And that is that when Alex finds the article about when Gordon Bombay, uh, when he stopped coaching, I zoomed in and copied down everything that article said because I wanted to get it there. And in that article, it says, Gordon Bombay, parentheses, May 12th, 1962. And I paused on that immediately and went, that's not how old Gordon Bombay is. Because that is Emilio Estevez's birthday. That is exactly how old Emilio is. Gordon, according to the first three Muddy Ducks movies, is five years younger than Emilio Estevez is. And yet, for the rest of this episode, and I'll deal with this more in the penalty box, they just present as, as if all of those timelines in D1, D2, D3 just didn't really happen. That he was magically 34 when he tried for the NHL, not 29, which they say very explicitly at the beginning of D2, that Gordon Bombay, 29 years old, former lawyer. So, but I did like the fact that they took Emilio's actual birthday and worked that into the episode. I thought that was charming. Okay, so if we do the math correctly, Gordon would have been 34 right around the time of D3. A couple of years after D3. Because D3 is supposed to take place two years after D2. Or actually, no, I guess it's one year after D2, which itself is supposed to take place one year after D1. And in D2, he is playing minor league hockey for the Minnehaha Waves, which is the minor league hockey team of the Minnesota North Stars, a team that no longer exists. Now they have the Minnesota Wild. But he is 29 years old. And it says very clearly... Like, you see it in the episode that he gets slammed, he hurts his knee, and he's limping for the first half of D2. The understanding of that was, yeah, he blew out his knee, probably an ACL from the way that he got hit. So, if he's 29 then, then say he's 30, max 31, when D3 happens. So, for them to say, oh, yeah, he made it to the pros for one period when he was 34 years old, that means that after already blowing out his knee once, getting a shot at minor league hockey at 29, he somehow, after going through the Goodwill Games as being their ambassador and all that other stuff, then decided to give it another shot at 34. Someone gave him a chance. He made it all the way there and then had the exact same injury again. Is that unlikely? I, yes, I, it's wildly unlikely. I don't, it's possible. I think it's possible. But, I mean, Miracle Man. The Minnesota Miracle Man. We can get into the penalty box about all of that. But. Yes, but I'm glad you brought up the article mm-hmm. because have you ever seen an article that reads like a Wikipedia entry the way that that one did. This article was written by an artificial intelligence. That is the it, only it thing was that Wikipedia, I can understand. Yeah, it was a Wikipedia article for sure. Yeah, yeah I mean, like, I mean, it. There is a weird dystopian thing moving across this country right now, where because local news is progressively dying, uh, more and more of the larger newspaper chains that has to co- that have to cover larger areas, larger distances, and can't employ as many people, they are now employing artificial intelligence bots to just grab facts online and auto-write short-form articles about what has happened in local sports. And that is exactly how this read. It was like, here are a series of facts. Some of these facts may not totally make sense, but it's good enough. Dystopian. (laughs) Mark, what was your Easter egg that you found in the duck hunt? So I did really enjoy the orchestrations still. The underlying music that had that D1 tune going on throughout the episode. I love being drawn back by music as a musician. I I hear that title song and it instantly tugs. Brilliant. Um I would very happily like to point out that this episode 
despite the fact that it may have created some sort of weird like pretzel logic with the Gordon Bombay thing. Just a split universe. Yes. Side note, if this is set in the multiverse of the Mighty Ducks and this is like Earth 2, I'm not mad at it. Okay, just putting that out there. I kind of love the idea of this being the Mighty Ducks' darkest timeline. (laughs) I'll shave my beard into a goatee. Never a bad time for community reference. The thing I loved most about this episode was... I, I don't know about either of you, but even though I didn't play hockey growing up, my brothers, they played hockey. I was 10 by the time my parents realized that hockey was a thing, and... By that point, I was considered geriatric and it was too late for me to start because the 10 year olds were literally at the level of the ducks. And I, you know, much like Nick, have and had a podcast body even before podcasts were a thing. But the thing I appreciate, for some reason, every single one of these movies have made Pee Wee hockey seem like an NHL sport when it comes to the fans. These stands have always been packed to the rafters Mm -hmm. with lots of people. I went to my brother's games. None of their games were ever that full. Was your brother on the Mighty Ducks team, Andrew? Was your brother on the team that changed the face of hockey Forever, Andrew, or should I call you if that's your real name? You know what? Their games had the same level of attendance as this Mighty Ducks group. And it was nice to see that Disney didn't just pay a bunch of extras in Vancouver to come in and cheer for a peewee hockey game at a level that does not exist. I appreciated that. I assume that you're largely right there, but my dad is from Oklahoma, and when it came to football games, if you go to Oklahoma or Texas or even into Georgia and Florida, a high school football game will have 80 <laughs> to 90% of the town there. Now, to be fair, that is not major cities. Mm-hmm. That is that is more rural areas, and 80 to 90% of the town might be... 10, 15,000 people max. Uh, they are in the Twin Cities. So there's a lot of other things to do. So I get your point. But just saying, uh, if the Mighty Ducks are a nationally acknowledged institution that clearly pipelines a lot of people into college and possibly the pros, maybe. I don't know. I won't. I won't fully rule it out. They have a branded hockey arena to themselves. It is the Duck Pond, Hendricks Arena, for the Mighty Ducks, a team that had a professional team named after them. I'm not going to rule it out. I'm not. I I understand your point, and I feel like this is a great start into the penalty box, which is always my favorite part, because I love to complain about things. I'm just going to say, like, this Mighty Ducks team is a farm team for juniors. Yes, absolutely. 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 Well, what did you think? Did you find any Easter eggs that we missed? Let us know in the comments. And if you point out a really good one, we will do it in corrections and omissions next week. Or we just missed it. That could happen. That could happen. Yeah. And, and we admit we are fallible. You know, we, we, we are human beings. But no, barely. No such thing. Nah, nope, never happened. Nope. Let's jump into what I would say is David and Mark's absolute favorite segment, <laughs> The Penalty Box, where grievances are aired. You got a lot of issues with you people. A lot of issues with you people. <laughs> uh, Mark, can, you- I, can I get a high-pitched penalty box? It's the penalty! Damn, that was some Celine. Okay. All right. I'd like to start this off. Okay. First off, I'm going to read out loud the article, at least what we saw. (laughs) 
Ahem. Bombay out at St. Paul State. Gordon Bombay, parentheses, May 12th, 1962, for some reason, is a retired American hockey player with multiple of those words capitalized for no reason. Turned coach. Regarded as a hockey icon, he is considered to be one of the most iconic and influential athletes in the history of ice hockey. His longevity and success have earned him the informal title of Godfather of Hockey. <laughs> However, for Coach Armani, that just isn't enough. After six months at St. Paul State, Bombay is throwing in the towel, leaving his students and comrades behind. When asked about the sudden decision, Armani stated he just wasn't a good fit and would be better off, quote, doing his own thing. What will this mean for Pee Wee Hockey in the future? Are there comparable? That's the end of the visible article. So, to start, the god, the, what was that? The Godfather of Hockey? Oh, there's so many things I have to not, get into right not, now. Not there's Wayne, so many not, things. Not Wayne Gretzky, who everyone has heard of. Who but, exists in this universe, for the record. He made know. a cameo you're right. in D2. You're in right. D2, he absolutely did. Assuming that this is the same universe as D2. And as not a Splinter universe, we've explained that it might not. Yeah, it might not. Yep. This could be the Mighty okay. Ducks Darkest Timeline. Moving on. So, I'm just going to take this line by line here. Uh, because I'm going to ignore the atrocious grammar and the random capitalizations. Starting number one. I brought this up earlier. Why is Gordon Bombay suddenly five years older than he was before? Unless, as Andrew put it, he somehow, after blowing out his knee, getting a shot at minor league hockey and then NHL at 29, then left being a brand ambassador for Hendricks and a globally acknowledged and respected coach. I don't agree with it, but he was. To then try again at 34 and make it and then suffer the exact same injury and also get his teeth knocked out this time which they mentioned. I went back and watched the beginning of D2 again. He does not lose any teeth. Honestly, the hit doesn't even look that hard. Um, but So unless all of those things happened uh, when he was 34, which also wouldn't line up with the timeline of the years since then and all that. It's, it's nonsense. Um, he's randomly five years older now. That's one. Two, his longevity and success have earned him the informal title of Godfather of Hockey. It's established in D1 that he stopped playing hockey at 12. What? He did not play... In D3, they argue that he played in high school, but that's already established as not true in D1 and D2, so we're dancing with nonsense. He did not play in college. He then became a lawyer. A lawyer. And... Then came back and somehow magically was able to either get one or two shots at the NHL. So uh, this whole argument of longevity is absolute nonsense. Uh, I have no idea how he could be one of the most iconic and influential athletes in the history of ice hockey when um, he played allegedly one play in the NHL and was a coach for a couple of years, maybe. Third, who the hell is Coach Armani? <laughs> I mean, at first talking. I thought, is that a I'll nickname? Is I'll that a out. nickname for Bombay? Did he go back to the old Captain Blood mode, so they called him Coach Armani? Maybe. That's not explained or referenced anywhere. Was Maybe it Coach it's an Armani? Joke. Or oh, it says, however, coach... comma, for Coach Armani. That just isn't enough. And it's not one typo. They call, they talk, reference Coach Armani twice. Okay. Then, okay, however... For Coach Armani, that just isn't enough. After six months at St. Paul State, Bombay is throwing in the towel, leaving his students and comrades behind. It is later explained in this episode that the reason that Bombay stops being the coach there is because... Hold on, I wrote down these words as well. Uh, I quit the Ducks when they changed, when they became the team that only cared about winning. It was a heartbreak, but I had to let them go. I did play pro. I lived the dream for one shift. A 19-year-old player hit me so hard he tore my ACL in half and knocked four teeth out of my head. But I got up, and yes, I put together an awesome college program. We were unstoppable. He's like, I didn't walk. I broke recruitment rules. Turns out there are actual state laws. I gave money to a kid who didn't have any, a good kid. He couldn't afford tape for his stick. Seemed like the right thing to do at the time. He plays for the Islanders now. I was asked to quietly resign and told I could never coach college again. So I spent my entire life chasing hockey, and I have absolutely nothing to show for it. 
the rest of that is. I mean, except the Ice Palace, my friend Jan left it to me in his will, along with a ton of debt to go with it. I'll get into that also. Yeah. He's like, so no, Alex, I don't hate hockey. I love hockey. And that is how all of this happened. Um, so to go back, how does one manage to build a powerhouse unstoppable program and get expelled for recruiting violations inside of one season? Six months isn't a whole hockey season. He doesn't even have time to recruit kids and put a team together in six months. That's not how college recruiting works. That takes years. That makes no sense whatsoever. So how would he magically have put this team together in a six-month period? That does not make sense. Also, as we've established previously, and is seminal to D1 and D3, Gordon Bombay is a lawyer. He actually says, turns out there are actual state laws. This man is a lawyer saying, turns out, there are actual state laws. What? 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 <laughs> You're a lawyer. We, we did establish also, don't That don't he's, a forget, terrible he's a terrible lawyer. terrible lawyer. <laughs> he's a terrible so makes, lawyer. So it all makes sense in here. And this is on my penalty box too. I'm going to jump in um, saying... He gave the kid money to buy hockey tape for his stick. Yes, he should not have done it. That, by the law, is giving money. Does not mean that you will never work again in no. a college setting. We've seen it in Division I sports forever. Rick Patino is coaching at Iona. Rick Patino is happily coaching D1 again. Kelvin, been... Kelvin Sampson just was in the Final Four. Yep. John Calipari has fled every school that he's coached at. This is a thing. And we talked about this last episode. If you're a good coach, even if you break the rules, and it's sad that this is true, but even if you break the rules, you will get a chance somewhere else. So the idea that somehow in a six-month period, nonsense, Gordon Bombay assembled a dream team that was un, like unstoppable and then somehow got caught and expelled forever from coaching which again uh, how does how does your private school ask you to resign and then you're banned from coaching that's not how any of that works if you privately and quietly resign that's to protect your image and the school's image meaning you just go somewhere else come on also i'm sorry you're a coach you don't have tape for a hockey stick you throw the kids some tape. You have the best hockey program in the nation we've seen, and the athletic team doesn't have hockey tape for the right. stick. No one's going to slap your wrist for throwing a kid some tape. That's not going to be viewed as an improper benefit. That's like 80 cents of, sure, let me help you out. Screw it. That's, that's, honestly, that's less than they would pay on postage to mail him things. Why does his teammate not have tape? Why does the school not have athletic? Why is he going to CVS? Why is this scholarship athlete going to CVS and buying his own tape? There's a whole lot of nonsense in this. A whole lot of it. I, I've, we have more. We have more. We love the, the penalty box because we, we care so much about this franchise and it just seems like a lot of things are missed, and a lot of things are... And that was a big one. That was a pretty big plot line to just overlook, or like not... And I really need to know who Coach Armani <clears throat> is, because that doesn't make any damn sense. There is a coach named Fabio Armani, which is a made-up name, I feel, <laughs> but... Um, there's no way that's a real person. And if he is, I bet he has great hair. Uh, I'm going to jump in and say a big penalty box for me happened after the Mighty Ducks game. Um, two players came up and hit Evan as hard as they can after the game, and no one says anything. Mm -hmm. Kick them out. Kick them out of the junior league. Are you kidding me? Yep. Referee then says, oh, the game's over. Talk to me about it for the next game. Yeah, remind me for next time. Remind me for the next game. How do you have your own arena and your refs don't know hockey? 
We are back to the Junior Goodwill Games. Yeah. I think that's something that we have just established in the Mighty Ducks verse. The refs don't actually know the rules of hockey or they don't care enough to actually enforce them. Or... But the game was over, I guess. So it didn't matter. But yeah, I mean, if this were a normal. That's league, a very Mitch McConnell argument. I guess if this were a, normally, a referee argument. They would have been suspended mm -hmm. for at least one game for unsportsmanlike conduct. At least. But uh, we're, again, living in an alternate universe where these kids are being treated as pros. It, it, it's that simple. Which all the more means that they should be penalized. I was a wrestler when I was in middle school and high school once everyone else grew and I could no longer play basketball well. And... I remember wrestling someone once, and the guy did a cheap move on me, and I instinctively slammed him like it was WWE. And I lost that match, because apparently, that could have killed him. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, w w was this guy okay? Yeah, he was fine. Like, okay. I, was it, I basically, what? like, I, I did the knee scoop, and I just full football style just body slammed my whole weight into his chest, and the ref immediately was Ouch. like, that's a completely illegal play. You lose, like, no, you, you forfeit this match immediately. And my coach was just like, you know, if you don't lead with your shoulder on that, that's probably okay. I was like, yeah, sorry, I just wow. kind of combined sports. And he's like, yeah, you can't do that when you're not wearing pads. So uh, my, 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 my best friend g g growing up, uh, shout uh, out to Aaron, but he, he's a wrestler too, and he would – tell me these stories about he, he would pin pin some opponents in what's called a Saturday night ride I'm sure I'm sure you've heard yep. of it David uh-huh um, although a a legal move correct is it legal it is it is technically legal as long as you do it right basically the person who is pinning jumps on top of the other man like a whore in heat on a Saturday night and then pins you in a... That was... That, I was not where I was expecting that explanation <laughs> to go. It's, I'm not going to say whether that's right or not. But it's not wrong. <laughs> I'm going to argue the definition of wrong. Okay, so he inherited the, the Ice Palace from Jan... And a ton of debt with it. Not from Hans. No, from Jan. Right, I know. Right, but I just paused on that where I'm just like, okay, wait, so you inherited the business and a ton of debt? Again, you're a lawyer. There are better ways to do this. If he had no relatives, debt died with him if you structured it right. You're a lawyer. You're a lawyer. You're a lawyer. You're bad. Stop being bad you're a at bad things. lawyer. Yeah, you're a bad lawyer. You're a bad lawyer. Also, uh, we, we've joked before that as a coach, Bombay has just been magically lucky with having effectively super athletes on his team that he didn't really have to coach. And so I did smile a little bit that he got banned from coaching for recruiting violations because that's how he's always won. <laughs> um, the other thing that I had a slight just personal quibble with was the very end of the episode when Bombay takes down the no hockey sign. It's a nice moment. It's a touching moment. He's re-embracing his love of the sport. Why is the wall more sun-faded and dirty behind where the sign was? That's not how sun works. When you have something on a wall for a long period of time and you take it off, that's the part of the wall that's not faded because the sun can't get there. So why is it magically faded behind the sign? Does it have its own sun? Is, is the heat from his hatred of hockey cooking his walls? That's a fire hazard. Yes, it is. It is. I did see that. It didn't bother me all that much. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that I've been on enough sets to know that uh, set dressers are miracle workers. And sometimes a director will say something at the last mm. minute like, what the hell? It needs to be a different color behind the sign. So they like have to like basically grab a magic marker and mm -hmm. create something on the spot so that the day doesn't go into triple overtime. 
so I, I based on my background, would give them a pass. I, oh no, I get it. They just did it backwards. <laughs> Uh, so two more penalty box things, small things. One, when Gordon Bombay grabs the coaching Bible journal and he writes down this magical play. He's so sneaky about it. He's not writing anything. (laughs) If you watch his hand, he's like doing, this is Disney Channel logos and scribbling. (laughs) It looks nothing like any sort of writing or play uh, whatever. It would have been the funniest thing if he was just drawing butts. He was. <laughs> lightsaber she farts. She opens it up like, oh, what's this? It, yeah, it's just lightsaber farts. <laughs> um, so that bothered me a lot. And two, <laughs> I hate doing this, but like, ugh, there's just, there are just some people in this show, not the main characters, but they're just such bad acting. Really bad. And I don't like to point that out. I really don't. You're doing it. I know. And I want to. Because the guy playing <laughs> the coach of the Mighty Ducks. And they walk mm. into the hallway. Not Gunner. Not Gunner Stahl. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he's yelling at his team. And it was literally like... You are the mighty ducks, and you will, there was finger waving, and you will not, you will not be this team, because we are the ducks, and you are players on the ducks. I'm going to wave my, it was just, bruh, come on. Have you been injured in a workplace accident? (laughs) That's what it was like, and I was like, bruh, going to stall, come on. That dude is a bruh. Yeah. Uh, total bruh. He, he, his name is Dylan Playfair in real life. His Again. name is not Gunner. <laughs> and his name is not Scooter. Mm-hmm. No, it's not Scooter either. But David, I did love that moment because it basically set in motion exactly what you predicted last week, which is I am very angry that they are so thrilled over one goal how dare you give them any joy despite the fact that by every single measure that was a victory which i'm shocked they didn't score more goals because they scored like what like five goals in the first like two minutes allegedly it was 17 to 1 if the opposing team has one player who can skate one who largely is just standing there one who needs to lean on his stick to survive one who I assume is hiding nunchucks under her pads. <laughs> and one who I assume is playing defense by just emotionally destroying people. Plus a goalie who does not remember that he has legs. You can pretty much score at will. Especially if you're as good as Sophie. I mean, she's just... She can put the puck anywhere. She's hitting golf balls off of, off of traffic cones with the puck. She's exceptional. So the fact that this was only 17 to 1, that's gibberish. <laughs> I'm going to throw out one argument. I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here, so I'm going to throw it. out one argument. Mm-hmm. I could see a scenario where off camera, Sam is just doing nothing but throwing his body in every single direction anytime he sees someone who has the puck. Actually, I legit can see that. I had not thought about what Sam was doing this whole time. That's really fair. Because we should. W W W S D. What would Sam do? Sam would try to grind Too on much. the boards. Yeah. 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 All right. Uh, so that brings us to the end of our penalty box. But what was your penalty box for the episode? What little Easter eggs just piss you off all that much that you want to get nearly as angry and upset about it as David did, because let's be honest, nobody can really reach that heights beside you, David. I'm holding it in. Prove us wrong. <laughs> <laughs> let us know uh, in the comments below. Feel free to try to prove us wrong, but let us know your thoughts. And that, my friends... Wait, I got one last thing that I got to bring up, because it's a nostalgia line... It's technically a branch off, but uh, a friend of the three of ours sent us an image yesterday 
that I have since verified, uh, and it is that uh, I'm going to tie this into Coach T, the idea of like, oh, a very pretty person who's also an actor, kind of. And we assume that they're wooden and, you know, talking like a lawyer. Uh, the guy who played Spider, a.k.a. like the long-haired, tattooed, naked torso guitarist in School of Rock, his name is Lucas Edwin Babin, and he is now the district attorney of Tyler County, Texas. So, Coach T, if you end up losing your job as the coach of the Mighty Ducks, perhaps you have a future in politics. <laughs> well played. I also love the fact that Lucas Babin has a brother who continues our theme of not real names, Leaf Babin. And he has a niece named Liberty Babin. Listen. A name is a name. Liberty, Liberty, Liberty. Babin. <laughs> okay, yeah, we should go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. No. Oh, crap. We forgot Keenan again. I'm looking at the Zoom right now. I know. And he's just been sitting here he's waiting, waiting patiently for like half an hour. Keenan, we're really sorry. We'll get to you next week. Let's jump into our final thoughts really quickly. Uh, David, I'm going to throw it to you. Uh, any parting wisdom? And please let us know why Dave Carp owes you $10. I said I'm never going to tell you. And like, If he pays me back, then I will share the story. But until then, I'm holding my leverage. Uh, final thoughts. It's going to be fun to see Bombay coaching again. Um, in a Ted Lasso sense, I like the idea that the entire MO of the Don't Bothers is going to just be to create chaos because they're not good. So that's fun. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what the battles are around Sophie joining the team. And also, uh, since the first Mighty Ducks movies, it was very much like you live in this area, therefore you're on this team. I'm intrigued to know how you can just switch teams. Um, that seems new. I don't really understand under those same rules how the Don't Bothers could just form. I figured that out. So the way that it worked was this was clearly a second team within the same district, which right. would allow people to jump from okay. the Ducks and Don't Bothers and vice versa, which mm -hmm. I'm assuming by episode eight is a position that will be offered to Evan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, that makes sense. That makes Mark, sense. final yeah, thoughts, Mark. I'm excited to, to keep watching. Um, I hope that the Don't Bothers get some sort of better uh, or else it's it's just they, they scored a goal which was very exciting and they 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 celebrated themselves and I guess they also celebrated holding the the Ducks team to only 17 goals which we've established is a huge accomplishment when it you is are not great um excited excited to see this excited to see more bombay antics and and quips and witty comebacks hope there's more andrew i just want to say overall uh this episode made me happy which is something i cannot say about last week's episode um, I like the fact that this has now actually become a TV show. And I hope to see more of what we saw this week going forward. And also more of the adventures of Mustard Tim. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you are Spin watching off. this show, if you're watching the show, let us know what you think of Mustard Tim. <laughs> let us yeah. know what you think of Mustard Tim, Coco Charlie, Ketchup Chad. Kevin... Coco Chad. Sorry. Coco Chad. That man is uh, the chattiest of Chads. Yes, he is. Uh, the Chadness. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. Thank you all so much for joining us. Please let us know any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you're on YouTube, please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. We've got a lot of fun stuff that we've got coming up. 
along with the conversation about these upcoming episodes. If you are listening to us in audio form, please take a moment, go to the podcast platform of your choice, rate us five stars, leave a nice review that could either include general thoughts about this particular episode or general compliments towards Mark, David, or myself. And thank you. Just thank you for being here. Yeah. Yeah. With that in mind, one more apology to Keenan Thompson. I have been Andrew. I remain wow. David. And I'm Mark Winsky. We'll see you no next time. Bye bye. <laughs>